to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. All right, welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly webcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm your host, Chris, and with me tonight is our host, Jesse. Hello. And our other host, Robert, is not being a host tonight because he is off recording another show. Shame on him. We are hostless. Yes. Again, when the cat's away, the mice will play. <laughs> so, uh, Jesse, what have you been doing this week guitar-wise? Uh, noodling around quite a bit. <laughs> um, a lot of the blues things, again, the backing tracks, which I love those things. I mean, too. Oh, yeah. A um, little bit of scales. And uh, prepping a guitar for some work, which we will talk about in a bit. Excellent. Yeah, I've been uh, woodshedding it a little bit, working on a couple of licks. Some uh, have been inspired by Dave Gilmore, some were inspired by Eric Clapton, and uh, basically playing with a metronome and trying to set a metronome at a certain rate and then, you know, play eighth notes, triplets, and then quarter notes to try to build rhythm because I am rhythmically challenged. <laughs> How's your sanity after, like, practicing with a metronome? Oh, boy. Uh, actually... <laughs> I don't mind the structure. I think it definitely gets on my wife's nerves to hear the beep, beep, oh. <laughs> beep, beep <laughs> at, you know, 90 beats per minute or whatever it is that, I, you know, I'm working at. Mm -hmm. uh, so I found a, I use my tablet for my metronome and I found a sound at setting number two on the app that sounds more like a drum uh -huh. than a, a beep. And that's a bit offensive for her. Yeah, that's it, it helps when there's just a basic drum machine noise or something like that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, computer generic beeping can be annoying and so <laughs> I can, I can definitely appreciate that. And the old style, you know, the same Oh, thing. yes. <laughs> I should get one of those. I should get one of those old style uh uh metronomes just to just to be cool. And then you could say I did it for you. <laughs> that's right. You no longer have to hear the beeping. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's great. I actually get like a whole bunch of, have you ever seen those videos where they all go in sync? They're all like on a, a levitating platform and they start them all at different places and let them go and eventually they all sync up. <laughs> oh you should check God. it out. You seen when they're that. all it's, like out, oh my gosh. Yeah, they're all out of phase and then all of a sudden they start insane. like, yeah, they all, they, they couple it. It's really cool. So anyway, this is not, uh, uh, not uh, <laughs> physics things and string. I don't know. I just can't do it off the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> fun with physics with jesse and chris um no it's uh anyway it's off topic but anyhow that's what i've been working on this week and uh so i think we'll go ahead and just get into our our two segments if you will and in the past we've looked at guitars and talked about guitars from various websites and tonight we are going to look at a guitar uh not from a website but from my house a uh, recent addition to my guitar family which is a uh american made 2004 Fender Highway 1 Telecaster, and that's a mouthful, and I'll show it to you here. So, again, we're sort of amateurs at podcasting, so we're going to do the, uh, the zoom by taking the guitar up Closer. to the camera. <laughs> you can see the headstock, you can go across the fretboard, and there's the finish, the sunburst finish, satin finish uh, guitar. It's so, beauty. It is. I really like this thing. Uh, I really am a fan of Telecasters now, I think, after playing this thing for a few weeks. There's a lot of you Tele fans out there. Oh, uh, well, you know, it's the guitar's been around for a long time, like, you know, 52, something it's, like that. Yes, it was the first, well, arguably one of the first solid bodies. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were a couple of prototypes, but that was the first production one that I can think of. I think it certainly is the first successful production. Definitely that. I would, I would say that. Um... Play it here just a minute, but just to give uh, some of our uh, dear nerds a uh, uh, sort of a chance to uh, hear what it's got in it. It's got some kind of pickups in it. The guitar is 10 years old. I don't know if there's been different pickups been put in this thing or not, but uh, we'll just assume they're original pickups because why not? Um, so you got your standard uh, Tele bridge pickup, you got your neck pickup, and of course you've got the middle selection, your knobs, maple fretboard. Uh, let's see, what else do people want to hear about it? American made ashtray style uh, uh, bridge with the three sort of saddle kind of setup, that original Tele setup, if you will. Some folks argue that that's the only way a Tele should be. I don't know about that, but I do like the fact that it, it can't be intonated properly. 
<laughs> uh, and we're back. Sorry again for the technical difficulties. Apparently, I did not turn my amp on properly. So let's try this again. All right. Uh, a lick in just the bridge position here. All right. Now, let's do the neck pickup. And then the other position, which is both. And there we are. You know, it sounds like pure blues when, you, when there's no backing, but if there was a lot of thrashing guitar behind it, I would swear it's an ACDC song. It is an ACDC song. I know. Oops. <laughs> all right, let me do some bad podcasting here and turn my back again one more time. <laughs> That's all right. I'll do a song and dance while you're, uh, while you're doing that. <laughs> That way we're not getting any uh, weird pickup uh, <laughs> noise from the amp. So, yeah, uh, I, I like the guitar. It's, it's uh, fairly versatile for what it is. Uh, I'm really digging uh, not just the bridge pickup, which is the classic Tele sound, right? Mm -hmm. But that neck pickup has just a nice sound to it, especially when playing the blues. I really do like that neck, neck pickup. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. It's a real warm sound. You don't think about that. Like, like... As a non-Telecaster player, like I, I you hear the country twang a lot, you right? Know? And then like with more fuzz, you hear like a lot of the classic rock. I know Jimmy Page of Zeppelin did a lot of solos on, on a Tele, but you don't think of the neck pickup, and, and that's really good sound. Yeah, definitely like the guitar. It plays well. It's a easy playing guitar. It's got tens on it right now. I think I'll probably put nines on it next time I change strings. Mm -hmm. uh, just to be more that authentic, I guess, I guess telly or, or whatever, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> so, you can yeah, and is the, uh, two, that's right, I can be all, yeah, it's going to bend a little bit more. I bend on tens all the time, though, so that's not a, not a problem. So, anyway, that's the uh, 2004, 2003, or something like that, uh, Highway 1 Telecaster by Fender. If you have a chance to try one out, I would recommend it because it's a fun playing guitar. All right, let's go ahead and move on to sort of the main topic for today's show, and that is a guide to guitar maintenance. Excellent. So, uh, somebody has a brand new guitar, they're brand new to the guitar. What are the most basic things they should be able to do to it eventually? So, the first things are, um, well, the easiest thing, of course, that everybody has to be able to do pretty much is change your strings. Uh, so, you have to be able to do that. Um, there's tons of guides on, online, so go ahead and find some. <laughs> and they're very specific to the guitar. So how you would string uh, a Telecaster is a lot different from, you know, a Stratocaster or a, a Les Paul. They all have little different bridges. Um, sometimes there's different tuners, if you have locking tuners or whatever. And if you have something with, say, a Floyd Rose on it, that's a whole other kettle of fish. Yep. Good, good luck to you. <laughs> yes. Hopefully, you, yeah. Hopefully, you're not in a position where you're 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 a straight up beginner and you ended up with a Floyd Rose guitar and trying to figure out how to, to deal with that. But yeah. if you are, hey, no problem. I mean, you know, you learn. That's the whole thing, exactly. thing right? That's you learn by doing. Exactly. Yeah. Don't don't sort of get suckered into like the guitar shop shop that'll say, oh, you know what? For nine bucks, we'll change the strings for you. Yeah. No. No. Learn how to do it yourself. Because you should oh. be doing it every couple of months or so, and it's going to add up pretty quick. Oh, absolutely. Um, some of the players would change strings for every show, that, which is a little excessive for me. <laughs> yeah. I guess if you're a pro, I don't know, maybe, but I'm not. Yeah, I never got more than like a change a month on any given guitar. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and kind of what goes along with um, with restringing the guitar, which should happen, you know, as we, as we say, every month or two or three, um, depends on, the, on, on your taste, of course. Uh, is once a year, maybe a couple times a year, um, some basic cleaning as well. So, you know, not every time you change strings, but at least once a year, um, clean the fretboard. You know, some, uh, some uh, four-aught steel wool is really nice to polish the frets. Um, some, uh, well, depending on how dirty the fingerboard is, if you have a uh, ebony or rosewood fingerboard, you can clean it with the, the steel wool as well. Most people like to go with the grain so it doesn't scratch the fingerboard. I tend to go against the grain because I think it feels better, but it doesn't look as nice. That's true. Um, and then um, also after you're done cleaning with uh, oh and um, don't don't clean uh, 
don't uh, clean the uh, the lacquered maple fretboards with steel wool, typically. Um, so you can, you can, um, in fact, if it's a very glossy surface, you can clean it with that four-out steel wool and it'll kind of take the gloss away. Um, but it's, you know, that's a personal taste and a lot of people like to just leave it. Yep. Yep. Um, oh. And then, um, probably once a year, particularly in the winter, it's good to condition the fretboard if it's not a finished fretboard. If it's ebony, particularly if it's ebony, but sometimes rosewood too, to put a little bit of um, fingerboard conditioner. Some some places will sell it as fingerboard conditioner, but uh, lemon oil is popular too. And just rub it in there and then let it set for a bit and then wipe it off and that'll keep your wood nice and happy. <laughs> but don't overdo it. I right. don't want to dump the stuff on there. Yeah, and get the stuff for guitars. I think there's another kind of lemon oil out there that is not good for guitars. Like I've heard it's some kind of, uh, it's actual lemon, or I can't remember what it is, but what I've been told is that there's something out there that's called lemon oil you shouldn't put on. So People I've use I'm, all kinds of different things. I mean, yeah. I've heard bore oil used from, uh, I guess, uh, brass instruments. I mean, there's different things that people use, uh, but lemon oil is probably the most popular. Yeah. I have some kind of spray-on cleaner conditioner. Mm -hmm plant wave that works pretty well and you'll know when it needs to be done because the especially the rosewood gets nice and dry and you can actually see it basically change color and that's probably actually waiting too long but that's typically what i tend to do yeah so it, yeah, go ahead. yeah i'm sorry go ahead i was gonna say because it's a gradual change you know yeah. <laughs> then when you actually condition it it's like boom very nice you know oh well, yeah this is like it's like it's like using a pick too long like you, know, you get a new pick and it's like oh what was i missing out like i can't believe i was using this damn pick for so long and so absolutely so and those are like two things that are really easy to do uh to learn how to do changing the strings and cleaning and conditioning the fretboard and honestly when you have the strings off of the guitar if you take them all off at one time wiping down the guitar body is a great idea um mm -hmm. just because dust and dirt gets collected, no matter how clean you keep your hands when you play, uh, if you sweat or whatever the case might be, you'll get some dirt on there. Mm -hmm. um, once you get over that hump, learning how to do those things, then what tends to happen for a lot of people is they start to wonder, hmm, can I tinker with this thing a little bit more, this of guitar? Of course you can. And yes, you can. <laughs> They're made for that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And there's, there's a couple, there's three things that are, uh, in particular, intermediate level um, adjustments one can make to um, get the guitar playing like you want it to play. Um, and one of those is adjusting the neck. And that can be scary at first. I know it scared the hell out of me when I first started playing guitar because I was like, I'm gonna break this thing. But you can do a tr truss rod adjustment to help change the curvature on the neck. And you can have a curvature that bows down. So this is like, so it bows down like this or it bows up like this. And bowing up like this is not good. You don't want that. Right. Because you'll have buzzing and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Um, but most people want a slight downward bow. So it makes a little bit of a U shape, very, very shallow U shape. Most people don't want a perfectly straight neck because that can be, uh, that can lead to buzzing and problems like that as well. Right. Um, so how do you check uh, curvature, Jesse? So that curvature is actually called relief if you ever want to talk to a, a guitar repair person about it. And um, the basic idea is that the string doesn't vibrate very much at the very ends where it's held down by the nut and the bridge. Um, it vibrates most in the middle, so that'd be the, somewhere around the middle of the neck. And so you need more clearance there, and that's why we put a little bit of that curvature, that bow in there. The curvature. Curvature. <laughs> so like the, the, the animation. My right? hand was down here. <laughs> so, uh, so the way to do that is the way to check it is similar to what we were talking about in a previous show about um, looking for a twisted neck, where you take a straight edge or take a string press it down at the first fret and then the 15th or the 17th, somewhere where it joins the body or close to that. And then look at the space halfway between those points and see what the space is between the bottom of the string and the fret. And there should be just a very small amount of space, um, maybe about the thickness of your thinnest string when you're taught. That's a rough estimate. And it's different for different people. Um, some people like a lot of relief and some people don't like much at all, almost a straight neck. Um, again, that, that diff distance between the fret and the string should be about the same on the, the low and the high strings uh, to make sure this, the neck is straight. Um, so if you have too much, let's say you've got about the thickness of your heavy E string, then your neck is bowed too much, and that's going to raise your action, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, um, especially around the, the seventh fret area. Your action will be too high. And so it's harder to play, in which case you want to tighten the truss rod. So you just put whatever wrench or Allen key that you have 
uh, that fits the neck. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> in there. Most nowadays, most truss rods are adjusted up by the nut, but there are some older ones, particularly strats and tellies, that have an adjustment down by the uh, where it joins the body. There are some strats and tellies that you actually have to remove the neck to make a truss rod adjustment and oh, then wow. put the neck back on. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, I don't, would not play with that. No. <laughs> Take it to somebody. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because you got to get a feel for how much the change will be, and you'll have that thing on and off like a dozen times, meanwhile weakening the bolt, you know, grip and everything. So um, anyway, so you would tighten the neck at that point in a little bit and never go more than, you know, an eighth of a turn, a quarter of a turn when you're first learning, and then play it the next day and see how what the changes are. Um, once you get a feel for how much change on that guitar changes the curvature, you'll get a better feel for how much you can go. Um, if your neck is perfectly straight or even up bowed so that there's no distance between the bottom of the string and the fret, then you need to put some relief in there. And that's loosening the truss rod, um, again, a little by little until you get just a little bit of space there. And you should find that that really helps the, uh, the feel and playability. Yeah, just make the turn, eighth of a turn or so, let it sit, see how the wood handles that, and then let's say even overnight maybe, mm -hmm. try it again the next day, see if it's where you like it. Don't be afraid of it as long as you do small changes. I think that's one of right. the big sort of, you know, concerns that most people who are getting into guitar maintenance uh, are is that truss rod there. They get really Absolutely. afraid of that. Because um, so, it'll yeah. make noises sometimes like, <laughs> you're yes. hearing this thing in your neck and you're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, that telly uh, I assembled from the Grizzly kit. Boy, I think we turned that uh, that truss rod nut about four complete revolutions before it ever took. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was a little excessive. I don't know what was going on with that, but but yeah. it, it took eventually. It, it, it did. Good. Yeah, and now the next fine. I, and so yeah, I just I was getting worried there after we you know after one complete turn, all the things I read online don't ever do more than an eighth of a turn. It's like oh my gosh, you know here we are eight yeah. times that. <laughs> I've never heard of a neck actually taking that much actually. But. Yeah. We're special. Uh, it's a special neck. That's <laughs> right. Well, so a little less extreme uh, changes, if you will, um, to the guitar. And these are things that you'll want to do um, when you change strings or change string um, gauges, especially when you change string gauges, would we'll be checking the guitar's intonation. And what you'll find is uh, along the length of the guitar, uh, if you tune it, the notes could eventually play um, incorrectly. So, for example, if you uh, play, let's say, the first string, it's an E open, if you fret the 12th um, string, you should get another E, one octave up. Mm -hmm. However, uh, what will happen is if the saddles by the bridge are not aligned properly, you won't get an E. You'll get another note. Slightly and E. Slightly E. A little <laughs> off, a little off, or maybe lots off, depending on how bad the guitar is. And uh, you'll just need to do a uh, intonation where you'll slide the saddle up or down, use a screw, and turns the um, saddle forward or backward, and um, changes that note that's played. And of course, what you'll have to do is change your tuning as you change that, because that will affect the tuning a little bit. At least that's been my experience. And I always get this wrong. And so uh, please correct me, Jesse, if I get it wrong. But I think if you move the saddle closer to the nut, it becomes sharp. And yes. further away, it becomes flat. That's correct. And what actually happens is as you move the, uh, the saddle closer, um, it, both the open note and the 12th fret note are sharpened. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that the 12th fret one, because the string length is, twice, is half the length, it's a greater percentage. So it'll sh get sharper faster. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, and if you have something like my telly, for example, you have two strings on a saddle, then you have to sort of play it out. You know, what do you like to hear? Do you right. want to keep the A or, or the E in tone? Or maybe you're really lucky and can get them both. There are some tellies that have the saddle that tilt a little bit. So mm -hmm. you can sort of compensate uh, right. for that. But intonation and um, action adjustment related to intonation. is Action is how high the string sets off the fretboard. And you'll want to essentially test that by... Sometimes people will capo at the first fret. And then they'll measure the height of, of the string above, I think it's typically the 17th fret. And there's different ways you can do that. You can get a six inch ruler, you can get a couple, there's action gauge cards you can buy from places like Stu Mac, for example, that will give you um, the action. And you can set it up either to the specs of the manufacturer or figure out what you like and set it up that way. Um, but you don't want to go too low because it'll buzz. Right. Um, yeah, and there's different ways of measuring that. I mean, um, mine always was uh, just measure the, the height at the 12th fret. But the problem with that is that takes into account the nut. So if the nut's not cut exactly right, then you're right. not really getting accurate. 
Um, and yeah, action is really a personal thing. I mean, you'll have jazz people or, or the shredders, you know, from the 80s, you know, who were all about fretboard gymnastics, and they would have very low action. Um, and the only way to keep it from buzzing is to have very light touch. I mean, you really have to. Um, works for them, you know. Yeah. Other people have a heavier touch, a lot of blues people or, or uh, you know, just heavy rock, that kind of thing. And you need a little higher action or put up with buzz. Yeah, and the tricky thing with um, action adjustments is um, keeping the fretboard radius. And so, you know, your fretboard is not flat. It has a radius of curvature to it. Mm -hmm. And it can be like for an old strat, that's usually seven and a quarter inches, I think, for the old strats, if I remember correctly. My strat's nine and a half, I think. Um, Les Paul's will be a little different. But if you have the strat style with the individual saddles, you'll have to adjust those individually to maintain the curvature of the, um, the fretboard. And that can be tough to do. And it's definitely worth maybe taking that to somebody who wants to see how it's done before you um, try doing that again. Um, or a Les Paul style, it's a bit easier because that uh, the bridge that they have, the strings all raise up and down together, and you can you can you can rise one side up higher than the other, but you basically preserve for the most part that uh, radius of curvature in the strings with that uh, two pneumatic bridge style. Mm -hmm. So um, let's uh, let's just actually keep moving forward. And we'll talk about the hard stuff to do because you've got a guitar that's uh, undergoing some serious surgery right now. <laughs> yes, I do. So my main player, my baby, is uh, in uh, Baltimore right now. Um, we uh, drove down to drop it off, because this, especially because this guy is good with stainless steel frets. The whole idea uh, that I wanted was, and, and mind you, there's nothing wrong with the playability of the guitar. It was fine. Um, the frets are in pretty good shape. But I really like the feel of steel frets. They're... Um, they're much harder than a regular um, nickel uh, silver fret, and so they they polish up. When they're polished really well, it's like playing on glass. It's just very uh, low drag, you know, smooth. And the other thing is they wear a lot longer. I mean, they'll last three or four times as long as a, as a regular fret. Um, so I took it down to him, and he's going to, uh, well, it actually already has, so hopefully I'll pick it up this weekend. Oh, cool. Pull the frets, level the fretboard, make sure everything is, is accurate, and then install new steel frets, which um, a lot of people don't like to do because uh, because they're harder. They're really hard on the tools that they use to install and clip and, and you know, grind and file and all that. Uh, so they don't like to do it. But this guy's good with it, so I'm excited. Yeah. He's uh, cutting a new nut as well. And, um, and then he's also, uh, he's putting it on this machine called a Plec, and basically it, it harnesses the guitar, and then this scanner scans with, to a micron level all the frets, the fretboard, the strings, and the action in, at every possible playing location, and then um, maps it out, and then grinds everything perfectly uh, accurately. That's cool. Yeah, it's neat. I mean, there's only a few of these machines out there, and so I was excited when I found out this guy's fairly close. Yeah. So I'm excited. Did you get to see Guitars, the machine? Guitars, grommet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did you get to see the machine? I did. Oh, cool. Yeah. There's a few different jigs. So there's one for like a tunematic type of setup. There's one for like a, a acoustic. I might be misspeaking here. I think that was what the, the idea was. I saw three different jigs for this thing. Yeah. And uh, it's just cool. I was bummed that I couldn't actually see the little grinding wheel going across the frets, you know? Yeah, yeah, that would be cool to see. Oh, uh, wow. that's awesome. <laughs> I can't wait for you to get it back. I'm looking forward to checking this thing out. And seeing, oh, yeah. Because uh, I've never played on a guitar with steel frets, so I would love to compare that to sort of, I'm sure none of mine have steel frets, so I'd yeah. um, want to love to check that out. I Probably much to my wife's chagrin, she'll be like, oh, now he's going to want steel frets on the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have an <laughs> <laughs> I, the Parkers that I have uh, have steel frets on. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So um, I'll bring one over. All right. It's definitely cool. Yeah, that's cool. So a refret job is definitely something you want to take to a professional. Unless, of course, you're a luthier and you're already a professional. So uh, then true. you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but it's definitely not something that uh, us lower mortals can uh, approach for sure. Um, a few other sort of, or another more advanced thing to do would be uh, swapping out your pickups. And that's actually not that difficult to do if you know how to solder. Right. And if you don't know how to solder, it's actually not particularly hard to solder poorly, like I do. 
Uh, <laughs> a little bit of practice. Hasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Uh, or in my case, a whole lot of practice. And uh, but you know, you can go online. You can hear some different pickups, and of course, you know, you can shop around that way. Now, obviously, when you hear online, you know, you sounds compressed. You different guitars, different players, different amps. You know, you want to keep those kinds of things in mind. But you can get some clips online of different types of uh, pickups, and you sort of compare and see what kind of sound you like. But that's certainly something that you don't necessarily want to do until you've played for a while. Right. Uh, that's that's some serious surgery to the guitar, and uh, you want to be able to figure out what sound it is before you start sinking lots of money into pickups. That's true. That's true. It's, it's just check them out. See, a lot of people start with whoever their favorite player is, and we'll find out what he plays or what she plays. Right. Um, but yeah, just listen to a bunch of stuff out there. It's hard to compare because you can never really just do a good A/B comparison. Yep. Um, so you just have to get an idea. Um, but once you're in the, in the right ballpark, as far as like a, a PAF, you know, one of the old Gibson Patton applied for, like a standard sort of humbucker, say, or a distortion device, that kind of thing. Once you're in the same ballpark, then whether you go Duncan or DeMarzio or the different brands, there's not as much difference. You know, there are differences. Don't get me wrong. People argue like crazy. It's like Ford right. versus Chevy, you know? Right, but, right. Uh, but I think you can get happy with, with one of those and then some amp adjustments, say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and don't don't um, don't o underestimate what you can do with us a, a change out of an amp because oh, can, you know that's that's an instrument too. Basically, it's part of the instrument. So it really uh, definitely do that. Uh, so we could have a whole episode on nothing but pickup replacements. <laughs> yeah, or, we could. Uh, nothing but advanced uh, guitar maintenance. But I thought what we would do is maybe just leave it here and let the sort of the beginning player um, sort of see what they could look forward to in terms of what they could do to the guitar. And maybe for the advanced players, they can make some comments on Twitter or on our Facebook page and say, hey, you guys forgot this. Or you forgot that. Cause I'm sure we forgot stuff and uh, help out these folks that are just learning, like myself, just learning how to tweak the guitar. So Absolutely. Uh, anything else you'd like to add tonight, Jesse? I think that's good. All right. Well, everything we need to say. <laughs> all right. Well, if you enjoyed this video, please click like and subscribe to the Jester Cat page. And until next time, just remember, keep picking and grinning. Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all other Jester Cat shows at JesterCat.com. You can also email the show at SST at JesterCat.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester 700, and Chris at CW Culp. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music.